Hi, this is Brian Merakian, Senior Principal of Populous, and this is One on One with ABC Partners. Hi, this is Dave Almy of ADC Partners, and yes, I have a cold. So I admittedly sound a little worse for wear in this episode. Thanks in advance for bearing with me. Now, do me a favor. Close your eyes and picture the most famous sports and entertainment venues that have been built over, say, the last 40 years. I bet some of the places that come to mind are stadiums like Camden Yards in Baltimore, Oracle Park in San Francisco, maybe Tottenham Hotspur Stadium in London, or maybe even the Sphere in Las Vegas. The one thing they all have in common? Well, they were all designed by Populous, the most legendary sports and entertainment architecture firm in the world. Now, Populous is celebrating its 40th anniversary, and my guest, Populous Senior Principal Brian Merakian, is celebrating his 20th year with the iconic firm. In our wide-ranging conversation, Brian and I talk about the evolution of stadium design and how it changes to address the wants and needs of the modern fan. We also talk about the importance of physical spaces in an increasingly virtual world, balancing design for different types of fans, and the rise of eSports-specific stadium design. The Kansas City resident also has thoughts on just how much credit Taylor Swift should get for the Chiefs' latest NFL playoff run. All this, and the legendary Reflex Gourmet lightning round at the end, too. Thanks for listening. Brian, I'm interested if you could please talk about your evolution as a a designer, right? I'm assuming this just didn't come out of thin air for you. Were you always interested in building and design from, like, a young age? You know, it's it's a, it's a great question, and it's one that I get asked uh, quite a bit. Um, you know, I I I actually did know from a pretty young age that I wanted to be an architect and I wanted yeah. to be a designer of, of some sort. Were you a Lego guy? Were you always like messing with that kind of oh, stuff? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's right. and that's that's the fun thing. I think it's a pretty common story with with a lot of people to go in the architecture and design profession. But you know, I loved, I always loved Legos. I, yeah, Lincoln Logs. I I I love well, old school. You know, old school, you know, I, I will say that um, from a very early age, you know, I really always just enjoyed, um, you know, creative expression, whatever that might have been. And I, I think that there were some pretty influential moments, you know, throughout my education early, early on hmm. um, through, you know, some en- enhanced art programs yeah. and things that, you know, like, like my parents guided me towards in terms of painting and and, and sketching and things like that, that I think were like really super formative. Were, were your parents artists too? You know, it's funny. My, my father's an attorney. My, 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 ah, very my artistic. Mom, my, I, I know <laughs> uh, so he, 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 he paints in, 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 in the, in the verbal form. Right. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, my mom uh, is, is, is very creative. Highly okay. Creative. I think that's where I got it from, but, uh, but no, it's, it's, it, it, it's like any sort of you know pathway that you take. I think there's these critical moments along the way that that you know very much influence your your arc. And um, you know, and and I did have some drafting. I had one very very critical moment I think in high school actually before I went into you know university setting. You know that really influenced my ability to kind of look at things in the world differently, and um, and and model creation and 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 you know at that point you know drawing on mylar and learning how to you know. You know, conceptualize a building really helped you know solidify you know where I wanted to go and you know from that point then in my backyard in Kansas City there's a, an amazing hotbed of um, architectural design specifically in relationship to sports and entertainment and it had always been a dream of mine actually to to work uh, for Populous in those days it was known as HOK Sports. So really right from the get-go like you had that particular firm targeted it was within your sense were you a yeah. sports fan too or was it just yeah. a Kansas City you know, thing? You know, it was it was it was interesting because um in the early days you know one of our one of our landmark projects was was Camden Yards. Yeah. And and so you know there's a lot of a lot of publicity right and visibility that came from that project alone. And it just was always resonated with me. I've always been a big sports fan. I, I've always loved the 
the overall sort of environment of going to games, some of my you know fondest memories um, from my childhood was going to Royals games actually with my my father, my grandfather. And it was just always something that was like, there was an awe, you know, yeah. to me around stadiums. And, and so it was something I always wanted to do. And it was just sort of a natural, you know, when the opportunity presented itself, it was sort of a natural bridge for me. I think almost everybody in the sports industry can point to that moment, you use the word awe, right? And almost everybody has that moment where they, you know, their first time they walk through the tunnel and see the grass and they talk about the vibrancy of the color that you just can't pick up on on television. You know, the sound of the crowd. And I feel like, and you said Camden Yards, like Camden Yards was the first stadium that I think people looked at and thought, wow, this is, this is, this is the design equivalent of that moment of awe. Yeah. Can, you, can you talk about the transformative power of that? I mean, obviously it influenced you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Can you talk about the impact of of that building, not just on HOK and really like putting their flag in the ground, but what did that do for the overall idea of sports design? Yeah. Well, I think it was a fundamental paradigm shift. You know, at that, at that point in time, many, many ballparks, of course, originally were part of the urban fabric, right? right. They were central to like the urban fabric in, in downtowns and, you know, cities. Um, urban landscape, um, you know, you can obviously look at, at vestiges, right, of the past, like, you know, Wrigley Field and, and mm -hmm. the park, right? But for many years, for many decades, um, we went away from that. We went to the cookie cutter, you know, multi-purpose stadiums. And I think I've heard, like, fondly referred to as the ash, ashtray stadiums. Right, right. You know, Three Rivers and Bush Stadium and, and others where really it became, you know, let's, let's, let's pull the buildings away from the city. Let's surround them by big areas of asphalt um and it was really about disconnecting the experience in a lot of ways and camden yards was really a moment where we reflected upon what was important and what's important to people what's important to cities is to actually have these places be embedded in the fabric and 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 so it was a return to to real downtown baseball mm -hmm. uh, and 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 really kind of it charted a new path, I think, for the the next you know generation of ballparks. Um, and of course, that was so contextually integrated, of course, with you know with the warehouse building and and you know it's just a walk really from waterfront and 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 just it, it's just absolutely architecturally you know um, contextually you know related. And it was a, a really important moment. Was it was it something that the city of Baltimore said we need something to do with this downtown that's going to Revitalized? Was that part of the equation for, for for Camden Yards versus you know send it out in the middle of nowhere and surround it with parking? Let's disconnect it from everybody. I think it was a lot of things, but I think that um, certainly um, historic revitalization um, and, and revitalization of, of downtown was, was a was an important driver. And I think that, I think that you know ultimately it, it's it's like it's like many things that that occur in, in design. You have these you have these sort of paradigm shift moments. It really underscored the value of, of secondary development and organic development that happens as well. And and from that point, of course, you know we've done you know twenty plus ballparks, um, you know, in the aftermath, and and many of them have been downtown. If you look at like, you know, Jacobs Field at that time in Cleveland, certainly Coors Field, I think is one of the best examples mm -hmm. of organic development and what that ballpark did to transform Lodo. And um, in that entire area of, of Denver, um, and, and I think, you know, Petco Park, certainly in San Diego, very similar, right? You know, ballpark gets inserted into a somewhat dilapidated area um, surrounding the gas lamp district. And you look at all of those warehouse buildings and all of that, you know, organic development that's come from residential high rise towers. And, and it's really it's really been the, the central catalyst, right, to transforming that part of the city. So. It's 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 one of the things that that we found and cities, of course, found was that a ballpark with that level of concentrated, you know, critical mass, right? And yep. the, the calendar dates, right? Yeah. Uh, 80 plus calendar dates, like in, in in baseball, when you can have that activity that's occurring that that many times during the year, it's such an important aspect to 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 growth and, and development potential. I mean, it's amazing to think that Camden Yards was 30 years ago, just about a little over 30 years ago that that first opened its doors and it it transformed stadium design and really like i said earlier it put hok now populous on the map and i'm wondering 
you know, as a business populace, and you've talked about this previously, when we were talking earlier, you said the spirit of entrepreneurship is, is central to success. And I'm assuming that's even more to the case now with, with fan tastes changing dramatically. How does, how does populace continue that particular aspect of its culture to make sure that it's staying on top of uh, abreast of trends and, and making sure that they stay relevant as stadium design changes and accelerates. Innovation and a culture of innovation has always been central to, to who we are as yeah. an organization, as a design practice. And I think that, you know, it's important um, for every, you know, for every company that's successful, right, to, to not only be addressing the market of today, but looking as far as you can into the future, you know, for, for that for that change. It's getting harder and harder, man. Oof. Yeah, yeah, it is. But, but, you know, for us, we have a very unique design culture. Mm. Right? We, we, we've been very fortunate um, to work on high profile projects that are very demanding, but the most important thing that we do is, is we have, we have very talented people right within mm -hmm. our organization. And so finding the right people, bringing them in and creating a, an environment of a very intensive uh, collaboration on a daily basis, but then also an environment where people are encouraged to be part of, of very significant levels of design thinking, and 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 really that that aspect of entrepreneurialism where mm. we give people the ability to go and create something new, right? I tell people all the time that like the most exciting project that we will embark on is the one that we haven't done yet, mm. and and so when you have that mission right? That you're not just trying to stay on trend, but you're trying to create something entirely different, right? Because that's what the market demands. That's what our clients demand is something that's never been done before, right? Like it's an incredible atmosphere to work within and people are very um, excited to, to be part of it. And it's, 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 just, it's really been the root and foundation of, of our success in, in, in many respects. I'm wondering if you're, to your point, you're always trying to look over the horizon to create something new. Sometimes sports teams and ownership groups uh, can be a little conservative, a little traditional. How do you marry that? Like, here's something that we see never been done before. Are, are the people who are spending the money on these facilities always like, oh, can't wait, or what the hell are you talking about? Like, where's <laughs> that balance strike for you? And how does that get, for lack of a better term, sold in? It's a really good question. I, you know, these, these are sizable investments as well, yeah, right? yeah. So hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, and, and the buildings today are becoming more and more complex and more and more integrated into broader development strategy. Right. And it's very rare candidly today that we embark on a project, whether it's an NFL stadium or a major league ballpark or a major arena that isn't part of a, a broader development strategy. Yeah. And so, one, there's there's so many learnings, right, in terms of behavior of fans. What do our fans want, right? And, and I'm saying that from an ownership level in terms of what do our fans specifically want? What are the demographics we're trying to appeal to? What are the broader aspects of, you know, content creation and, and, and marketing outreach? And, and, and ultimately, what are the types of things that we need to create something that's authentic to this specific place? Mm -hmm. right? And, 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 and so there's so much analysis that's happening by our, uh, the ownership groups that we're fortunate enough to work with that, that they, they know, they know in many respects in terms of what their fans ultimately want, but they're, obser they're, they're observing, right? They're observing what's happening in the current marketplace. They're observing what trends are, are happening, but they're also looking to us as their strategic advisor to help them guide their organization into a new place. And so I think that, you know, the work that we do is a culmination of everything we've learned, right? Along the way, right? As a designer, you're a culmination mm. of everything that you've encountered um, throughout your entire life. And so as a design practice, the work that we do is a culmination of everything we've done, which is, you know, candidly, one of the most important aspects of the work that we do is not just the built work, right? But it's the experimental work. It's the projects that have never been built. Um, but it's it's certainly the portfolio, right, of, of built projects that have led us to that point. And so when, when we have the opportunity to um, to engage with, with, a, with a new client, they're fundamentally looking about designing a building that will be relevant today 
and economically stable today and viable today in today's conditions. But they're also looking for their investment to reap rewards well into the future, whether that's 5, 10, 15, 20 years down the road. And in, in, in that's what ultimately is, is one of the most difficult things to design for. But that's where the, the real science uh, comes in, in, into play. I'm interested, too, in that. I think ownership probably has gotten more sophisticated than they have been in the past, right? They're the money's bigger, right? So they have to have smarter people, uh, bigger vision because of the dollars involved. Um, I'm also interested in how ready they are sometimes to have you say, we hear what you're saying. We see what you want to do. Maybe not the best idea. And I'm thinking specifically in the form of technology, right? Because I think everybody understands that technology is playing a more important role in how people digest sports or how people consume sports. But there's this barrier, like what's the, what's the, what's the uncanny valley kind of thing, right? It's like, at what point does the technology become disruptive to the experience versus additive to the experience? I mean, I realize I'm acting, I'm asking like a 50 point question here. So I'm going to try to refine <laughs> that a little bit from the standpoint of it, like ownership groups, willingness to take what you want what what you're recommending and then like specific to like technology where's the barriers for you where, where's a no-go don't do that does that simplify i'm not sure i simplified no, it no, 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 no. <laughs> technology fundamentally you know especially in the sports world is sort of like you know this panacea of like it's mm. kind of thing, right and 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 you know the interesting thing that we've found is that while technology is an important part of the overall experience in so many ways, right? Broadcast production and analytics um, standpoint, like smarter buildings, more responsive buildings, more efficient buildings. What we found is that people through the years, it's within their DNA to want to be together. They want mm. to go to a place. They want to share a common experience. They want to leave with amazing memories that they formed and they want to go back time and time again, because it is an amazing human experience to recapture that. And, and that's, that's not, that has nothing to do with technology. Mm -hmm. Honestly, like it's, it's one of those things that like throughout human history, you can go back thousands and thousands of years, you go back, you know, over 2000 years to, to the Roman Colosseum, you know, the Roman Colosseum was, was central to, to, you know, to public life in, in Rome. And it had nothing to do with, with technology. It had to do with people wanting to be together for a special experience. And, you know, we have looked, you know, for years at, at what do we believe the impact of technology is going to have. And we've seen so many wonderful examples of it, actually, like, you know, in the NFL, for, I use, use the NFL as an example, like, um, you know, they have created the most powerful broadcast technology experience possible with the in-home environment and the game broadcast that they've created. And there was a lot of trepidation for many years of just saying, well, stadiums are just going to go away because people are just going to have the in-home environment be better. And it's like, no, we just need to create a better stadium. And we just need to be real about the fact that people love being together. And when you look at like what has happened in terms of, you know, coming out of the other side of the pandemic, the one thing that we have seen is, is, is one incredible accelerated change, but we have seen the power of, of the human spirit. Mm. Just up. People love being together. The NFL is going to break every attendance record this year. NBA is going to do the same. Major League Baseball is up a considerable amount in terms of live attendance. I mean, you look at live music, concerts, Taylor Swift is going to break every record. There's so many examples of the power of, of, of the human spirit and people just wanting to be together. And, and I know that doesn't really answer your question about technology, but to me, I think it's a fundamental response to the way that we think about technology within our buildings. And we think of it as, as, as a secondary thing that's additive, right? And it's, it's a fun part of being there and people need to have, you know, access to, to Wi-Fi and there's all these in, in, in seat experiences and, and everything that we want to do and, and, and access to, you know, stats and, you know, games and you know, trivia and all these fun things. But at, at the core of the experience, it's about people being together. This is reminding me, when you and I did last talk, when we were sort of getting ready for this, for this recording, you know, I think we ended up talking for like 30, 45 minutes, and we covered a lot of different ground. And one thing that you said that speaks specifically to this is this idea of the paradox that technology and media 
can present, right? Social media being kind of inherently asocial in a yeah. way, right? Because we put ourselves in a bubble. Reality TV being like the least real thing that we've ever seen. And this age of virtualness really goes to your central point, right? That when in an age of virtualness, when we're sort of atomizing a certain bit, people crave those real experiences at a fundamental level. Like you said, it's a very human thing. And like stadium design kind of, these are some of the last gathering places we have for people, right? From no matter what their backgrounds are. And that speaks exactly to that, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, we, we find that that these places are are so important to people's lives, you know, and and they play an important role in in shaping a community. Um, yes, your your point is is very well taken. You know, we we live in a, a time, um, unfortunately, where there are a lot of like aspects of of technology, social media, things around us, this sort of world of, of artificiality that, mm-hmm. that continues to, to become more artificial in a lot mm-hmm. of ways. We're, we're programmed as consumers through the way that we engage on, you know, all sorts of technology platforms to, to make decisions and buy products and, you know, all these sort of things. And it's not helping in a lot of ways. It really isn't. Um, and, and so what it, what it does, though, is present an opportunity for us to invest in, in what we like to think of as social inf- in infrastructure mm. and in, in, in ways that we can build up communities through places of gathering in, that the public can enjoy. And if you look throughout history, it's been absolutely essential for people to have places of gathering in our cities, whether they're public squares or libraries um, or cathedrals, right, or, or churches, places for people to celebrate moments together and in stadiums, arenas, ballparks, these sort of places are really important to shaping um, people's lives in a, in a, in a very positive way. Um, people feel good, right? Yeah. They feel good when they go to a place like that because they can celebrate these moments together. And, and, and it, and it, it really is, it really is critical. And, and I, I use the analogy of, of, of the Roman Coliseum, you know, it's the same thing, right? People, love a place like Wrigley Field. They Mm -hmm. think of a place without it. Yeah. It evokes things. It it evokes things, right? And it's it's it it really, it really is um, you know, central, you know, again to sort of bring people together. And I think that it's it's going to become increasingly important because we are facing an epidemic of of isolation. I mean the, you know, it it is a it is a real thing. And and the more that we are, you know, exposed um, and our children and other generations are exposed to these sort of things, the more central it is that as designers, right, we take an active role in creating people that shapes people's lives in, in a positive way. In places of public gathering, in places for events to occur, in places for people to physically be together and to share those moments in their life where they're exchanging stories or information or just celebrating these moments around sports and entertainment, it's really critical, yeah. right? And we have to be able to, to continue to invest in those sort of things, you know, in, in, well into the future. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to take a short break. Uh, we're going to hear from um, the show sponsor, Reflux Gourmet, and then we're going to come right back and with continue our conversation with Brian Marakian, senior partner at Populous. Be right back. If you work in sports business, then you know that we sometimes eat really badly. Stadium food, after all, isn't exactly known for its healthy properties. Yeah, it's gotten better, and there are more options available, but generally speaking, I'm not seeking out the vegetable plate on the concourse. It's kind of ironic, right? You're watching these world-class athletes push themselves to the very limits of human potential, all the while scarfing down a plate of nachos loaded with shaved meat and a hot liquefied cheese that is a color that doesn't appear in nature. And while that food can taste so good going down... I almost always pay for it later on with heartburn and acid reflux. That's when I turn to Reflux Gourmet, the great tasting, all natural answer for acid reflux. You can't even believe how good this stuff tastes. Uh, A chef in Napa Valley curated flavors like vanilla caramel and mint chocolate. And it's all natural. I actually recognize all the ingredients on the label. But most importantly though, it just works. Only one teaspoon of Reflux Gourmet, and I'm good to go. Reflux Gourmet is available on Amazon, and if you use the promo code 10SportsBiz, you'll get 10% off on your first order. 
All right, we're back with Brian Marakian, senior principal at Populous. We're talking about sports stadium design, the power of design on people's experience, how important that is when you're going from a mostly virtual world to getting recapturing those moments um, that are like, for lack of a better term, very, very real. And Brian, I, I had a chance to go to Las Vegas and see the sphere, which is a Populous design building. It is, it's a remarkable building um, in that previously you just talked about the idea of these new cathedrals and, and places of gathering. And I was really struck when I was there. I mean, it's literally people standing around with their mouths open at the outside of, there's not even people not even going to see you too or anything like that. They're just outside with their mouths hanging open, getting that sense of awe of physical structure and how it, how it hits them. Is that the gold standard for design, like inspiring that kind of thing. And, and like, I mean, again, it's sort of like, like I said, it's like when you go to Europe and you're standing outside Notre Dame and you see people just staring in awe of it. It's the same thing. Is that like, when you look at that, you say, ah, perfect. That's exactly what we wanted. Is that what we're shooting for now? <laughs> there is always, I believe, um, some level of intentionality yeah. to bring that, that inspiring, that awe inspiring moment to people when they go to, a building, whether it's that building, whether it's Yankee Stadium, right, whether it's a small hockey arena in 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 Canada, yeah. right. What you want is is there to always be um, that special, awe inspiring moment for for people, like yeah. when they go to that place because they feel some level of just incredible excitement. Whether that's the moment of nostalgia, whether it's resurrecting a moment that they may have had or they shared with, with, you know, their mom or dad, you know, or one of their best friends, or, you know, we do so much work in the collegiate space. It's a homecoming every time when somebody has the opportunity to, to return right to a college campus and, and experience something. It's, it's an, it is an awe inspiring moment. And I think that, you know, certainly there are buildings that we embark on that are maybe more spectacular mm. in some way. And I yeah. think you know, certainly we are, there's so many amazing new, you know, techniques that can be employed in terms of integrating media technologies. We push the boundaries um, from a design and engineering standpoint, right? Yeah. The buildings have <laughs> so much ability to, to, to tell an incredible story. And, you know, the one thing I, I, I tell people all the time is that, you know, Populous, we don't really have a design style, right? Mm -hmm. There are some architecture firms you can look at and say, yeah, they're known for um, something. Yeah, they're known for this type of style. Like we don't really have a, a style. What we have is, is, is a, um, a deep rooted response to a place. And we try to create something that's very unique to a place mm -hmm. that people and in a community becomes beloved, right? Because it, it feels like it's always been there or it was designed specifically for, for them. And, and, and so we, we do push the boundaries. We do want it to be inspiring in, in its own way. And we want it to be something that's lasting and enduring. And so while something may be like a marvel, right? That is something new. It also needs to be something that, that stands the test of time. And I think that um, the other thing I would just point out is that, you know, we're designing for inherently new generation of people mm. in many respects. It's a new, it's a new fan. It's yeah. a new consumer in some way, but we're also designing for, for many traditional fans as well. And people that have been going to a place for, for decades, it's right? It's a tough balance to strike. It's a tough balance to strike. And so when you step through those doors, yeah. we make conscious design decisions alongside our clients you know, the way that we design today is so fundamentally different because, because the next gen um, fan, next gen consumer wants something entirely different. Like when they step into a building, it's about choosing their adventure in some way, right? They want really to they, they like interact with, with myriad different experiences and destinations, right? But we also have a purist fan, right? That we're, we're, we're designing for as well, that maybe it just wants to have more of a static experience where they're sitting in their seat. Right, who wants to be in the seat, who right. wants to focus on the game, right. who wants to do the scorecard, but yeah. the other fans, yeah. they want to roam. Yeah, and, and you, have to, you have to sort of design for both. And it becomes a very important design challenge to solve for. And, and ultimately, it's one of those things where, you know, when we look back historically, if you just take a, 
um, in NFL Stadium, for instance, you know, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, we may have had like five uh, different products in terms of seating products or, or a few, you know, premium products where there may be suites yeah. or a home space. We design a building today where we, we design 50 different products, right? Oh and, 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 you know, from, from, from really from, from different seating products, club seats, um, loge boxes, stadium, you know, field level clubs. We have clubs within a club, like we have VIP experiences and we have, you know, every man experiences and we have social zones where people can just stand and enjoy time with their, their family or friends and just watch the game in a very passive manner. We have sponsor activation moments. There's thousands of these decision points that we consciously design around. And there's so many demographics and so much stratification now in terms of where we need to hit the fans and the needs that they have um, in future generations that just behave entirely differently in a venue that it becomes a very complex thing to solve for. So when you talk about like awe and something that's awe-inspiring, the reality is you're motivated, right, to create something that's very much about people and making sure that every time they come, not only that one time, but every time they come, they still have that, that awe-inspiring moment. And, and it, it really taps into to designing something specifically for them. I, I want to touch on something you just brought up fairly quickly, because we talk a lot about marketing partnerships on this show, right? And I'm interested in also, because you talked about sponsorable spaces, do you take into account sponsor visibility uh, engagement, like opportunities like that, because it's a relatively significant revenue stream for these teams. So I'm assuming they want to create that. Is something is that something that goes into the design process, or is it more along the lines of, okay, well we have these spaces and they can be sponsored, so have at it. Yeah. Is yeah. that a is it a chicken and eggy kind of thing? Oh, it's a very very intentional part yeah. of planning of a building. And in fact, that's one of the things that we get involved with very early on. Mm -hmm. We have a, we have a sponsor activation team. Um, been fortunate to have built that team uh, for our practice um, for you know ten plus years. We have an incredible like institutional knowledge just around sponsorship integration, partnership integration, and so you know we'll work with the uh, corporate sales group, for instance, with with many of our teams very early stage because it, it's it, it is a massive revenue engine. Um, repeatedly. And so one of the big changes has simply been that you know again as you look at the past. Sponsors wanted to essentially have, you know, 2D, you know, advertisements, right? Yeah. That were on walls or maybe on a video screen. It's yeah. some exclusivity. Now it's very, very much integrated into the overall design of the building, right? When we designed Climate Pledge Arena uh, and Amazon was, you know, one of our, 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 our you know, was the name of its uh, partner. And, you know, there's a lot of storytelling, right? We have a hundred plus foot living wall that tells mm. the entire Climate Pledge story, right? Yeah. And, and, and so, so, you know, in terms of, you know, premium products, um, sponsor activations, every part of their partnership portfolio is represented in some meaningful way. And it, it, it becomes a very, very inter integrated design challenge that you're solving for. So it's, it's one of the other really, you know, instrumental parts, right, of, of planning and ultimately, you know, carrying out the design of one of these buildings. So I want to talk a little bit about something that you're becoming increasingly known for. And this is the design of esports spaces and esports arenas right now. These take on, well, I think, and <laughs> I don't want to sh showcase my ignorance here. These seem to take on a wholly different approach than a traditional stick and ball sports design. What are some of the projects you guys are working on right now? And how do you approach that design experience versus something that would be considered more traditional? Great. Great question. And, and, and it's one of those, you know, it's a new uh, form of entertainment, mm -hmm. right? That, that has really, really become um, an important part of the overall entertainment li landscape um, as, we, as we've looked at it um, over the course of the last, uh, better part of the last 10 years. And, you know, when we started to investigate esports, really gaming, digital entertainment, what we saw was that there was this incredible groundswell of activity that was happening. Much of it was happening in Asia, um, candidly, South Korea, China. Mm -hmm. And we saw people that were gathering for these major events. And it was like, wow, like 
this is something that we really needed to take seriously. And mostly going to, to traditional arenas to do this, right? I mean, they were correct. mostly like, you know, screens of people in the circle center of a correct. bowl and the whole deal. Correct, correct. You know, stadiums actually and, and, and arenas. And, and so, you know, we were also having a lot of conversations with some of our partners like Goldman Sachs that were really studying esports mm. at an analytical level. And everyone came to us and said, you know, if you are not thinking about esports, you really should be. Yeah. And for us, it really crystallized um, that we needed to begin to look at this at a research development level or in the early days and, and try to translate uh, the principles that we knew and we, we, we gathered over the years, our institutional knowledge around, around traditional venues and how that would translate into, into an esports and digital entertainment environment. And so I kind of call it the, the days of designing the concept car. We were taking these principles, right? And we were, we were looking at this conceptually. And, and from that, what we learned was that people inherently want the same thing from a traditional sport. It's what I talked about earlier too. When, when they're watching, when they're watching esports, right? They're cheering for a team. They're cheering for a, a competitor or a, a team that's competing, right? Against, against another team. And, but what, what people love about esports as a competition is it's a fundamentally human experience, right? Mm. You're playing, you're gathering, you're cheering for these iconic, you know, hype moments. And, and in the same way that you would if you went to the Lakers game, right? Or you went to a Yankees game or, or what have you. The difference is there, there are just some nuances related to the way that we design venues so that we can, instead of optimizing views, for instance, to a, a court or a, a field of play, what we're optimizing is views to a screen. In, in many respects, right? And so you're optimizing a view to not only what could happen on stage, but you're trying to create an optimal environment to see digital content that's surrounding you on a screen. And, 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 and then we have all sorts of secondary, you know, spaces that we design, you know, for those, those in-between moments and for socialization and, you know, the types of things that you would see at like a Comic-Con or, you know, people that are in costumes and all sorts of fun things like that and broadcast moments and technology and the things that are central to powering an, an event. There's a lot of nuance to designing like an esports, an ideal optimized esports um, competition environment and really proud. Um, you know, we've, we've, we've done a wide variety of these venues across, you know, for pro level, you know, competitions. There's a lot of activities happening at a collegiate level. And I will tell mm. you that there's a significant amount of activity happening in Saudi Arabia at the moment and a massive investment by um, the Saudi government and um, recently just announced a populist project um, in Kadia that will be really transformational. Um, and if anybody listening to this wants to head online and see some of the drawings for what's being planned in Kadia, I highly recommend it makes the sphere look like a mall. I mean, it's, I mean, it is, it is going to be one of those moments where people walk around a corner and go, what? I mean, it's, it's pretty remarkable. Yeah, it's exciting. And, and, you know, I think it, it's one of those things where it, it, right now it's an incredible um, hotbed of activity and it, it's a great example, right. Of, of, of investments uh, for something that is happening today, but, but really setting up for a, a new future form of, of entertainment and, um, you know, to the things that we discussed earlier, you know, what we have found with esports and, and gaming, right, is that it's one of the most, you know, universal forms of entertainment. Um, candidly, during the pandemic, it was one of the most important things that we did. You know, people went inside, and they wanted to, they wanted to find new forms of entertainment to engage with, and they went into, you know, digital places. And, um, and so, you know, as we look at sort of the, the new horizon, right, there's more gamers now over 55 than at any point in, in world history it is a truly global phenomenon. Yeah. And, and so we, we, we certainly are, are very excited about uh, the future of that, that where that landscape goes. And, and for us, of course, designing the venues and the live experiences that, that accompany that and, and bring it to life in new ways. And um, so, yeah, so it's, it, it's been a great part of our, our practice. I think it's a, it's a good example of, of always finding new vectors, right? Yeah. Looking at what we have traditionally done well, looking at you know the landscape of traditional sports, traditional entertainment, but then always, always trying to stay on the forefront of what's next. And and that's it's a it's a really good example of that. All right, you're heading off to South by Southwest here in the uh, in the not too distant future. You're going to be giving a talk on the importance of place. 
and what that means in the public arena and for design standpoint. I think we've touched upon a couple of the different concepts that you'll be speaking to, but is there any any uh, inside dope for those of us who have not been invited to South by Southwest? You don't inquire how to have quite the same access that you that a speaker might have there. Any any uh, any previews you can provide? Well, Dave, first and foremost, I think you should come because it's. <laughs> It, it's uh it's it's pretty awesome yeah I bet. for any of your listeners and i'm sure many of them have, have been it is i i describe it all the time to people it's like one it's an amazing party so it's it's so much fun because there's like you know always down for that a hundred thousand people that gather and it's 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 music and you know it's it's film premieres and and you know and, and it's and it's thought leadership and it's 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 just it's in the heart of austin which is always just such a fun place such a fun place ago. i was just there yeah. a few months ago yeah it's great but um but yeah it's it's become this incredible phenomenon and 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 so you know we're we've been we're really honored to to have um, one of our sessions selected for for the uh, uh for the interactive design track and um, yeah, it's all it's it's going to be a discussion around designing the social infrastructure for communities, and the importance of uh, a lot of what I discussed earlier, right? In terms of this this time, you know, in, in our modern society, mm. being able to create physical places that people can can share and experience and love, and 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 why that's important. But it's going to be cool. We've got um, we're we're going to have uh, Ariana Vargas, who actually just joined Populous, but um, she. Uh, she actually designed um, an app that um, is is all about um, really bringing people to, um, for uh, mental health. Um, mm. She designed that in a, in a virtual place. and It's tremendous success. We also have um, a gentleman by the name of Dr. Colin Allard, who's a um, author and researcher uh, about uh, uh, basically behavioral psychology as it relates to designing um, places and cities. It's called uh, Psychogeography. Uh, wow. Um, he's written some incredible books around it. And then, and then um, I'm the least smart person. On our so, so like, I, uh -huh. I, I'm, I'm going to talk about like, you know, how, how we design buildings and, and, and physical places. And, and, well, if you uh, need a smart ass pod podcast get host, you, know, you just let me know. I, I fit right in. You've heard I love it. it. I love it. But uh, no, it's, it's going to be, it's going to be super fun. And we're, we're looking forward to it. And, and, and hopefully, you know, you'll, we'll have some of your listeners that might be down there. And if you are, come come check it out. Mention the podcast, and you'll get nothing off of anything. I don't have <laughs> I don't have anything to offer here. <laughs> Brian Marakian, Brackian, uh, senior principal at uh, at Populous. Thanks very much for joining us today. Uh, but before I let you go, um, I am going to put you into the um, world famous uh, Reflex Gourmet Lightning Round. Okay. These are a series of questions. You don't you don't know what's happening. You know this this is probably prepping you for the Q and A part of your South by Southwest talk because you just have no idea what's coming. Uh, Brian, are you ready? I'm ready. All right, let's do this thing. Um, in your opinion, what from history has been the biggest sports stadium abomination from a design standpoint? Oh my goodness, that's a oh, that is such a tough one. Um, I'm I'm trying to think. Uh, through um, gotta be quick first thing that comes to mind I I, I have to take a pass on oh that. okay we well, only get one pass and you've used it up on okay, the first okay, of okay, five okay. questions so you're in deep trouble <laughs> Sorry. all right Populous is based in Kansas City a city famous for its barbecue uh, what is your go-to barbecue restaurant recommendation uh Jack Stack Jack Stack okay very good um you and Populous are leading the development of e-sports venues what's your go-to video game uh Fortnite I love, Ooh, you're Fortnite I, love, I love playing that with my son. It's, it's, it's so much fun. All right. Very good. All right. All right. You studied architecture in Italy at the, uh, I'm going to see if I can say this right. Uh, Santa Chiara study center in Castiglione Fiorentino. Yes. How'd I do? You know, yeah. you, you, did well. yeah. you did well. All right. The town is famous for a horse race that goes around the Piazza Garibaldi. Um, how much money did you lose wagering on that race when you were there? <laughs> You know, I, I didn't lose any money, but it was amazing. To, it was amazing to see. Yeah, uh, the, the, the polio. Um, the polio. I saw the one in Siena. I mean, it's it, yeah. if you can get yourself over to Italy, neither Siena or uh, Castiglione Fiorentino, uh, yeah. I highly recommend. All right, last one. Yeah, go ahead. Last one. No no, no embellishment here, Marakian. We got to move quickly. <laughs> the lightning round, not the let's talk about it. Okay. Round. Okay. All right, ready. Last one. This is another Kansas City related question. If the Chiefs win the Super Bowl, how much credit should Taylor Swift get? <laughs> oh my gosh! Um, you know what? 
she should get a lot of credit. She should get a lot of credit, at least for all the eyeballs that are going to be on that game. She, and she is an amazing phenomenon, and we have been so blessed to, to have her be part of this uh, this whole story throughout this year. So I hope they do well. We got we got a couple more games, but we'll see. All we'll right, see. here we go. Brian Maracki, Senior Principal at Populous. Thanks for the time, man. Uh, thanks, Dave. Appreciate the conversation. Thanks for listening to this episode of the One-on-One Sports Business Conversations podcast. If you enjoyed it, we always appreciate a subscribe, share, comment, or like. And don't forget, you can always find past episodes at abcpartners.com slash podcast. This podcast is written, produced, edited, and hosted by Dave Almey. And theme music was composed by Scott Holmes. <laughs>